What creates monsters? The concept of evil and terror manifesting into frightful beasts of violence and destruction is as old as human perception itself. In his book, Humans Need Monsters, Hubert Fisla postulated that the creation of monsters was a necessary and natural step in humanity's endeavor to understand itself. By pooling ideas of malice and misfortune out of the abstract realm and into physical, palpable creatures, we transfer them into a form where we can instinctively understand them better. Thus, fictional monsters and evils are always a dialogue, an investigation into our cultural psyche about what evil we fear and what ideas haunt us at night. In service of that investigation, fiction doesn't just ask what a monster is and represents, but also where it came from, as that is often indicative of what we might consider a source of suffering and misfortune. To a series like My Hero Academia, the term villain is among the most uttered expressions imaginable. In a world where the central conflict revolves around the opposition between the upstanding heroes and the nefarious villains, most outlaws and antagonists are bestowed said moniker. However, one must differentiate between the villains as a faction and THE villain, the main opposing force of the story and in a way, its monster. And while there are many villains in Hiroaka, there is only one man worthy of being called THE villain. It is safe to say that Tomura Shigaraki has undergone a startling metamorphosis, transforming from a pretty underwhelming popcorn baddie into what I now consider one of shonen manga's finest main villains. The presence he now possesses in the manga is founded upon a carefully structured and masterfully realized character arc that has created one of Hiroaka's most layered people, and it is this person that I would like to take a deep dive into in this video. As briefly alluded to in the previous sentence, what I think makes Shigaraki so good has in part to do with layers. Therefore, I find it appropriate that we structure this video in tandem with those very layers. First, I want to start off with the most superficial layer, Shigaraki the character, where I'd like to do a bit of basic character analysis and discuss how his characters evolved and progressed through his tenure in the story. Next. I would like to look at how the foundation laid out by his character arc is used to construct the second layer, Shigaraki as a narrative device. We'll dive into how the events and progression of his character feed into the narrative structure and plotting of the story, and how it sets up textual multiplicity and interpretability, basically how Shigaraki aids in turning mere text into a story worthy of analysis. And then, finally, we will look at how both of these layers end up creating the third and deepest layer namely that of Shigaraki, the thematic element. His character arc presents the story of a person, which fulfills functions within the narrative, which then go on to inform and reinforce the story's themes and central core statements. Thus, by working our way deeper and deeper, we'll understand how each piece of this character ends up creating and guiding a red thread of brilliance. So, without too much dilly-dallying, let's get started. To begin looking at Shigaraki's presence in the story, one must first understand and chart the journey the character has taken. Being born as the grandson of a great heroine, Tenko Shimura naturally held the wish to become a hero himself, even without knowing about his grandmother at all at first. This might have been in part a timidly defined response to living in a household thoroughly opposed to the hero profession. His father, Kotaro Shimura, hated and suppressed any mention of heroism in his house, as he was abandoned by his hero mother, an event that traumatized him. As Tenko seeks to maneuver the proverbial minefield of managing his dreams versus his household situation, he's afflicted with a mysterious skin condition that makes his entire body dry, cracked, and itchy. 
This comes to a crescendo as his quirk awakens following an instance of abuse from his father, who beats him in a fit of rage after Tenko's sister snitches on him. Tenko's quirk manifests as decay, the ability to destroy and annihilate anything he touches. At first unintentionally, but eventually gleefully bloodlusted, Tenko decays his entire family, killing them and destroying his father's estate, realizing that his skin condition had been his urge to destroy and kill, which had now been satisfied. Homeless and ravaged by both his quirk and his returning itch, Tenko wandered the streets, passing many a people who could have helped him, but refused to out of convenience. The only hand that eventually reached out to him was the hold palm of one white-haired man in a suit, miraculously capable of touching Tenko without being obliterated. The man took Tenko in, nurtured his killing intent, encouraged Tenko to give in to his itch wholeheartedly. Finally, as Tenko adorned himself with the severed hands of his family, the man bestowed upon him a new name, Tomura Shigaraki. Tomura is in reference to Tomorau, the Japanese word for to mourn, to announce the grief he will bring onto the world. Meanwhile, Shigaraki is the name of his savior, who now fully appropriates Tenko as not just his protege, but his successor, and the one to carry on the legacy of all for one. What's important to note here for now is how Shigaraki is treated like calamity, an unstoppable force made to kill and destroy that even he himself cannot resist. This receives a notion of tragedy when compared with his personality before his quirk manifested, timid and kind and just normal. However, by being subjected to this horrifying mutation and by society failing to save him, he ends up in the clutches of someone who doesn't wish to guide him to productively overcoming his urges and quirk, but rather to push him to becoming more violent and destructive. Already at this young age, Shigaraki is a force to be used, bent and twisted by those around him, as he marches towards annihilating anything he dislikes. It is this Shigaraki that we meet in the USJ attack, a bumbling child who is used to having his urges pampered and enabled by his master, incapable of truly strategizing or thinking ahead. Coupled with the fact that his quirk has weakened due to him repressing his past memories, this Shigaraki proves utterly incompetent at being a leader, a villain or really anything of consequence. He fails at USJ precisely because of his childish, impulsive nature, not having grown past a little boy murdering two thugs and an ally. He remains like this until he meets and witnesses hero killer Stain. To Shigaraki, him and Stain are the same, people seeing something they dislike and choosing to destroy it. At the beginning, it seems unfathomable to him why people flock to Stain's ideology over his own league, as to him, they both stand for the exact same thing. This is where he matures for the first time, as he actively seeks advice from someone other than his master, Izuku Midoriya. As Deku explains that Stain's ideology wins over Shigaraki's notoriety due to it being founded on an actual wider belief for society rather than just simple destructive urgency, Shigaraki evolves. He suddenly realizes that beliefs and symbols are what hold people and communities together. The symbol of reform, Stain, who unites those frustrated with the current system, and the symbol of peace, All Might, who upholds the status quo. He concludes that, to truly scratch his destructive itch, he must dismantle the symbols that hold together this fragile society. And to do that, he must ironically become a symbol himself. However, and this is another sign that he is growing, he connives to cheat a bit by appropriating the fame Stain had built for himself, embracing the misunderstanding that the hero killer worked for him. He resolves to do this act of destruction right, and to use any advantage he can find intelligently and tactically, already a far cry from the bumbling child of before. After this point, his entire demeanor shifts significantly. Whereas he referred to his subordinates as game pieces earlier, he now makes it a point to show respect and appreciation for his vanguard action squad, saying how they are all capable comrades who share his dream of destroying society and its arbitrary rules and restrictions, and by extension All Might himself. He now understands that to scratch his itch, he will need people who share in his ambition and raise him up and support him beyond just his master. He also shows significant forethought and strategy in how he lays out his plans, saying that whether or not the forest attack succeeds doesn't really matter as the very act of it happening will destabilize the public's trust in UA and in heroes in general. He also shows uncharacteristic restraint when Baku refuses to cooperate, stopping his fellow league members from retaliating and calmly announcing that they need to preserve his usefulness. 
These are all behaviors and expressions that USJ Shigaraki wouldn't even have considered for a second. As his plans fall apart, however, and his master is threatened, he briefly regresses and calls out to his master in desperation and to All Might in destructive hatred. Momentary character regression is one of Horikoshi's favorite tools of humanization, as people would logically not overcome their lifelong tendencies in a smooth curve, but rather with both ups and downs, hopefully with an upward trend. Just look at Todoroki's feelings towards his fire and his father. When All for One tosses him into the portal to escape, Shigaraki is, for the first time in 15 years, left completely to fend for himself. However, he isn't a child or a man-child anymore. Shigaraki has, under the guidance of his master and in the wake of the hero killer's contributions, become a confident and capable leader who is now supported by a network of comrades, small but steadfast. In Overhaul, Shigaraki meets his first proper foil after Stain, as the Yakuza leader is both equipped with a better version of Shigaraki's quirk and an army larger and more efficient than his. He forces the League under his wing after killing one of their members and directly insults and belittles Shigaraki repeatedly. However, just like with Stain, Shigaraki uses this opportunity to evolve into a man who can use someone like Overhaul as a stepping stone. Overhaul rules a monolithic entity of an organization, where everyone devotes themselves to his ambition out of either fear or cult-like exaltation. He doesn't have comrades, he has pawns and expendable bullets. His subordinates die for him because he would otherwise kill them, and he doesn't care much beyond their usefulness. The League, meanwhile, is less of an organization and more of a group of friends, who all share the same goal and therefore walk together. They're not bound by something like an organization specifically, they just so happen to choose the same path and are happy to walk it together. To Shigaraki, the League members are extensions of himself, and he takes them and any perceived harm on them very seriously, despite occasional bickering. He isn't their god, he's just a guy who leads them towards a goal they all dream of. This difference between the two is what Shigaraki uses to reaffirm his path. He allows Toga and Twice to deal with the situation in any way they see fit, and then conspires with the remaining League members to not just usurp Overhaul, but to also get revenge for Magne. He overcomes Overhaul because he's not a ruthless captain, but rather just a man who wishes to destroy, who values and supports those that share in this wish. That wish is tested again as the League faces months of scavenging and poverty following the capture of Kurogiri. With both their main source of money and their means of transportation gone, Shigaraki sets out to find his master's right-hand man, the Doctor. Again, Shigaraki makes tactical and calculated decisions in how to proceed in situations of strife, something his initial self wouldn't have done. After the gang gets faced with Giganto Machia and swiftly meets with Dr. Ujiko, he is confronted with the most blatant trial yet. Convince the Doctor of his ambitions. Here, Shigaraki speaks his wish out loud. To destroy. To the impatient reader, this can seem like a lame answer, as it's just more of his usual talk. But it is important to consider context and implicatures to really understand what Shigaraki is actually saying. He isn't just saying that he wishes to destroy because why not? He is declaring that his existence is characterized by nothing but the urge to destroy, which will never be satisfied, no matter how much havoc he wreaks. A world that gives birth to someone like him does not deserve to exist, or rather, a society that enabled him to get to this point is meant to be destroyed by him, until all that is left is a shattered horizon upon which freedom awaits those willing to rebuild and restructure. He doesn't really care much for the future or anything, he just feels that his never-ending desire will inevitably cause him to be the destroyer of this world. He is, again, a force with a simple goal, happy to be the act of destruction without concern for any real ideal. It is the first culmination of his lifelong journey to understanding his itch and what it means to him. He is a monster, and he must live with that and deal with it the best he can. And deal with it he must swiftly, as a new enemy approaches in the form of Redestro's Meta Liberation Army. Seeing Shigaraki's rise to glory as a threat to the mononuclear position of power Destro's descendants aspire towards, they challenge the League directly, kidnapping their broker and setting up a bloody deathmatch in the city of Deka, which consists almost entirely of members of the MLA. While Stain and Overhaul were foils that tested Shigaraki's charisma and leadership qualities, Redestro represents his first major hurdle, similarly to how Overhaul represents Deku's first test. A severely sleep-deprived and exhausted Shigaraki fights on the streets of Deka as he falls in and out of consciousness. 
This precarious state begins awakening old memories of his gradually, until the mocking words of Redestro finally free him of all that held him back. This is arguably the most important step in Shigaraki's journey. He has learned how to attract allies, he has understood how to wield them, and he has set his sight upon a goal worthy of such support. But now, he liberates himself of the final thing that limited him, his neurotic urges. Up until now, Shigaraki's urge for destruction was simply a personal defect, something that hurt and mangled him into a barely functioning man-child who had to succeed despite his urges. Sure, he eventually came to instrumentalize that urge and repurpose it as part of his main goal, but it was always something he had to overcome and then work towards. But now, remembering his origin and reliving the events that shaped him, he finally accepts who he is. He knew it, but now he embraces it. He is a monster, made to destroy the society that let him become the way he is, but he doesn't have to deal with it. His urge to destroy is not something to suppress, but something to take joy and pride in as he waltzes towards the broken horizon he chases. Everyone is born a certain way, and everyone needs to live a certain way, and Shigaraki finally understands that his certain way is the way of destruction. All of his anxiety and neuroticism vanishes as he realizes that to him, anything beyond destruction and his comrades does not matter. This wave of clarity washing over him is symbolized both by him destroying the hands of his past to cover his body, his true self, and by his speech bubbles in the manga going from wavy, stuttery messes to clean and smooth expressions. Shigaraki, in this moment, becomes truly free. As Redestro gazes upon a man who personifies the perfect citizen described by Destro himself, a freed individual liberated from everything that restricts his use of the Meta ability, he gives up his empire and bends the knee to Shigaraki, who swiftly forms the Paranormal Liberation Front. Destro's ideology is obviously easily compatible with Shigaraki's ambitions, not to mention all the money and power the change brings is handy too, so he accepts the position of Supreme Commander and decides to carry out his duties despite his slight annoyance at the responsibilities. Not just that, he also immediately prepares himself to undergo the doctor's grueling intervention in order to receive all for one. Again we see Shigaraki making rational decisions that will bring him forward and thinking long term. USJ Shigaraki would have never had the patience to sit through the PLF formalities and certainly not to endure agony for four months to get his gift basket full of powers. But he has matured, he has grown, and now he is ready to inherit all that his master was. Shigaraki's journey is fundamentally about accepting yourself in a world that did its best to teach you that you were unacceptable and deviant. It's about Shigaraki giving up his neurotic, antisocial tantrums and becoming a charismatic, focused, an immensely dangerous symbol of chaos and fear. The best example of this change came in one of the most recent chapters, namely shortly after he woke up from his operation. Back in USJ, when his plans started going wrong, Shigaraki threw a fit, scratching wildly and threatening to kill his subordinates for not executing his childish and unprepared idea properly. Now, 240 chapters later, Shigaraki awakens to his entire game plan having been compromised, his power not having been finalized, and his main source of progress, Ujiko, being caught. And how does he react? He calmly puts a cape around himself, calls his bodyguard, and, with a big fat smile on his face, tells him to gather his friends. He does not fret or worry or whine, because he is free, and the world is his playground. Now that we have extensively covered the actual, objective events in this fictional person's life, now we must discuss how those events create narrative functions and figures within the story. Because of the sterile nature of this particular layer, this section is probably going to be shorter than the previous one, but trust me, it is important for when we get to the final part. Instead of wasting time with me explaining what this is because it is a bit abstract, let's just immediately look at an example to see how it actually works. One of Hiroaka's favorite narrative figures is the parallelism, the property of separate story and character events mirroring each other and taking similar journeys. An easy one is for example that between Bakugo and Endeavor, 
Two heroes whose endless ambition and innate wish for superiority sets them on a potentially dark path, with the former renouncing that path successfully while the latter chooses it and regrets it deeply afterwards. Parallelisms are a staple of creative writing because they can establish relationships and connections without having to say anything directly about that which is connected. It is an elegant way to weave a compelling web of implicit connections and thematical bonds. And if there is one character in Hiroaka that is basically the parallelism merchant, it's Shigaraki. The most obvious parallelism that Shigaraki sets up is, of course, that between his journey and Deku's. Both start out as not just weak and incompetent, but also as incomplete representations of their respective story roles, with Deku only barely managing to hold up the mantle as protagonist at first, and Shigaraki being unable to really sell himself as the series' main villain. Both, however, carry, from the very beginning, the spirit necessary for their journeys, it just needs to be nurtured and guided. And both receive that guidance from their masters, who both are symbols of the worlds they rule. Both grow through the support and belief of others, with both awakening and evolving their powers consistently, as both of them clash with a trial version of each other. Deku fights a crazed nihilist who can kill with a touch, Shigi topples an organized idealist who boosts his physical powers in percentages. And both of them are tasked to carry the legacy of their respective incapacitated masters. This parallelism works to intrinsically tie Deku and Shigaraki together. As one improves, so does the other, as they both walk same yet opposite paths, parallel yet destined to cross. It works towards building up the inevitable clash between the two of them and creates a tension that will continue to build until they both intersect after reaching their maximum potential. However, another parallelism that Shigaraki establishes is the one between him and All Might. Direct ties to Nana Shimura is of course the obvious one, but there is more. Shigaraki, just like All Might, looked at society and decided that change was necessary, following the guidance of a master he adored like a parental figure. This is also where another narrative trope is injected, namely irony, as to say the irony that the parental figure Shigaraki looked up to is the man who killed All Might's parental figure, who herself was actually related to Shigaraki. This injected irony, combined with the parallel structure of Shigaraki and All Might's relationship, creates a sense of tragedy, as they are similar yet opposite due to the machinations of All for One. This parallel goes even further when you consider that among all the characters of the new generation, it is Shigaraki who carries Nana and All Might's spirit the most, as he is the only character who manages to smile through pretty much every single encounter or hurdle he faces after his master is caught. Even as he awakens from his metamorphotic slumber, his plans and ruins, he never stops smiling. Additionally, Shigaraki also sets up a narrative discourse about the fictional society of Hiroaka. We'll talk about this way more in the next section, but essentially, Shigaraki creates and maintains the question of the moral legitimacy of the hero system. While Stain is the character that most famously brought this specific question to light, it is actually introduced by Shigaraki all the way back in USJ. Sure, he doesn't mean the words he speaks here yet, but he is the first one to bring the hypocrisy and dysfunctions of the hero system into the story. And as the story continues and both him and his comrades reveal their lives and struggles, the hero system is consistently investigated and questioned as its many issues are laid bare. This has, over time, become arguably the most central conflict within the story of Hiroaka, and our main villain standing in as a consistent reminder and narrative activist to evolve that conflict reinforces its importance. Finally, Shigaraki establishes a certain fluidity to villainy. Evil in Hiroaka is not a constant quantity, but is instead consistently in flux. The table can turn at any moment, and the underbelly of society is one ever-changing pool of power dynamics. Shigaraki clashes repeatedly with other elements of the underworld, be it the Yakuza, the MLA, or the Creature Rejection Clan, or as I like to call them, the Quirk KKK. This creates a sense that danger can come from any angle, and that, more crucially, there are a myriad different ways and reasons to oppose the system, which flows back into the previous point. The system is flawed, and there are many who wish to reshape it in their own way. And if the words of a certain flame-wielding mummy are to be relieved, this idea is going to become more important as the series progresses.
now it's time for the good stuff. So far, we have stuck to purely describing and organizing the many facets that make up the diegetic or in-universe and narrative presence of Tomoda Shigaraki. Now it is time to get our interpretation goggles on and discuss what all of this actually means. Throughout the course of Hiroaka, we are presented with a world that is fantastical and almost utopic, at least initially. Everyone has superpowers and can follow their dreams unimpeded, as the idealized position of a justice-seeking superhero has become a normal part of society. You can be born with the power to fly, to shoot fire or to neutralize gravity. In essence, this world has the superficial markings of a caricaturistic fantasy. But of course, the first words we hear in the series aren't the world is great. No, the very first thing the text of Hiroaka tells us is that all men are not created equal. And under this scope, the world receives a different tint. The prosperity and idealism of the hero system is built upon the misery of those that were born in anything other than perfect circumstances. Those without a quirk are belittled and left alone in a society that sees them as an obsolete remnant of a humanity that evolution left behind. Those born with unheroic or even villainous powers are equally marginalized and ignored. Systems and rules made to only accommodate those who are compatible with the hero aesthetic, which itself has prostituted itself out of an altruistic service into a for-profit business. This is not even to mention that people, despite the normalcy of quirks, still do not actually receive any real education regarding what their quirks actually mean to them as people. Quirks aren't just superpowers, they are parts of a person's very essence, vital aspects of what they are that both shape and are shaped by that person's self-image and perception of the world. Characters like Toga and La Brava have their worldviews and emotional tendencies completely shifted and distorted by the way their quirk forces them to interact with their surroundings, distortions that adequate education systems could have prevented but chose not to. Those whose quirks impact their mental health or lead to discrimination or pain are just as boned. Society cares only for a select, specific slice of itself and would rather ignore the parts that take too much effort and change to address. But, as should be obvious, there is only so many times you can ignore your dysfunctions before they eventually have consequences. A society as corrupt and broken burns bright with the fires of injustice. And those fires cast a shadow. Shigaraki isn't the one that originally brings up the system's injustices for nothing. He is a representation of the evil of society bubbling up and combining into a dark avenger of sorts, an entity that is both tormented and exalted by its never-ending desire to destroy the society that created it. He is a shadow of the hero system, born out of its hypocrisies and dysfunctions and hell-bent on crushing it under his heel for no reason other than it's the only purpose this world could ever give him. He is all of what is wrong with the system, given shape, a voice, and a mission. The very thing that gives birth to Shigaraki as a thematic entity is, after all, a culmination of every broken segment of the system. His father's hate of heroes stems from being both abandoned and having his mother's disappearance be touted as an act of true heroism, despite the pain and suffering she left her family with. Tenko's urge to destroy, as well as his quirk, could have been caught by a more attentive, caring counseling process, one that would try and resolve not just the physiology, but the psychology of quirks. And of course, even after his devastating awakening, he still could have been saved, he still could have been reformed. But because it simply is more convenient to say, oh, I'm sure some hero will save you, instead of taking initiative, most passerbys ignored him in utter disgust. People don't wish to see those excluded from their own privilege, people don't want to be reminded of how broken a system they profit from is. And because there are virtually endless possible quirks, it's a handy excuse to just say that it's smarter to wait until someone else with the right power comes around. We see a facet of this social laziness even in the very first chapter of the manga, when the bystanding heroes cannot help Deku. It's important to note here though that none of these people are bad. None of them are doing this out of malice or evil. Rather, they are acting according to values and ideas society has instilled on them. When you are told that heroes are these invincible paragons that save everyone by the capitalist propaganda machine of the commercialized hero system, why should you, a random accountant, go out of your way and risk parts of your cushy life to help a random child? 
it's indifferent and unwillingness to risk a status quo, not evil. But it is these tiny, isolated acts of indifference and ignorance that pool together to create the oily black void that engulfs Shigaraki, perfectly illustrated by this page in chapter 237, where the panels of the single encounters with the passerbys form to create the skylines of the city itself, cleverly and clearly communicating that the small cruelties of the individuals eventually form and enable an uncaring, cold and unjust society. And it is this society that leaves the rescue of a bloodied child hanging for so long that the only hand that reaches out to young Tenko is that of the Lord of Evil himself, all for one. Most villains of traditional stories are introduced with their motives and powers mostly complete. They tend to know what they want, how to achieve it, and already have the ability to achieve it, with the plot tendentially revolving around the protagonists banding together to prevent the evildoers' machinations and keep them from reaching their goal. Shigaraki is quite interesting in that he does become that sort of villain by some point, but we get to see his journey towards that plateau. This works to make him a much more frightening monster, namely one that grows and evolves. Among his arsenals of threats and abilities, the most terrifying part about Shigaraki is his ability to reflect, look at himself and his experiences and course correct accordingly. Beating him once means nothing because all he will do is learn from it. This flows back into the role of society's shadow, as him being the stark counterpart of the hero system makes him as difficult to topple as the system itself, instead adapting and twisting to and around every single setback. In general, throughout his growth process, he can often be seen as a distortion of the values society heralds as indicative of its success. He is taught and nurtured by a caring parent, whom he, despite some brattiness, deeply adores. He constantly looks at his peers and himself and seeks to improve in pursuit of his goals and dreams. He values his comrades and friends and seeks to learn from them and enjoy their company. And as he follows his dreams, he never stops smiling. His parallelisms with Deku, All Might and the archetypical good person build this twisted journey that, on paper, can almost sound like a positive coming of age story. And it is this story that of course culminates in Shigaraki receiving all for One. I want to spend a bit of time on this specifically, as All for One is, just like Shigaraki, a thematic behemoth. In this world, where the power you are born with influences not just your possibilities and future and social standing, but your very personality and identity, All for One, the Quirk, is the greatest equalizer imaginable. The emergence of Quirks brought about a fundamental, biological, indubitable inequality that affects everyone. And All for One is the only power that could undo that inequality, as it can freely redistribute quirks. Since quirks are part of who you are, part of what makes you, you, the power to change that with a touch of a palm is akin to the power of a god, a savior that could fundamentally restructure society. That savior was first All for One himself, and now it's Shigaraki's turn. Their dream is to reshape the fabric of human community itself, and to that dream, many others who feel wronged by the system devote themselves. Those whose powers led them to insanity, to torment, to isolation, they rally behind this symbol of liberation, this idea of change. How fitting then, that he who carries all for one, always also receives a hole in the palm of each hand. I certainly don't have to tell you why that is relevant imagery to the idea of a savior. And Chigaraki becomes that savior of the downtrodden, not through cheating and stealing, although he does do that too, but by the support, belief and care of his self-built family. The League is insane and socially dysfunctional, but as twice the emotionally unstable member, time and time reiterates, they belong. They are a community of people who found each other, all discarded by the system, all eager to see it change and all of them wishing to see that change be brought about by a symbol that can rival and topple All Might, who to most of them is not a symbol of peace, but one of stagnation and of the upholding of the unjust status quo. Shigaraki mimics and adopts qualities of both Deku and All Might, and lives up to them better than either. He relies on his friends and uses their input to improve, just like Deku, and just like All Might, he never stops smiling, his eternal grin always facing the future he wishes to rip to shreds. Even All for One, the symbol of evil, contributes to this. If we continue to consider quirks as a core part of a person's being, 
Then All for One giving his all-powerful quirk to Shigaraki is seemingly an ultimate act of love, one worthy of giving birth to the savior of society. However, this is all very idealistic and only half the story. All for One, of course, does not truly care about Shigaraki, he merely wants his legacy to live on. The League is not some altruistic group of idealists, but outcasts and weirdos who want to live out their urges and desires and just so happen to push Shigaraki towards his dream in the meantime. But this is the part that truly makes this both interesting and tragic. Shigaraki and his pals have all the makings of a revolutionary group, but are stuck, limited by their own pain and scars. Shigaraki himself is consistently used and manipulated by All for One, even being forcefully given his name to symbolize their relationship. All for One, the original man named Shigaraki, forces Tenko to adopt his name, to unambiguously establish ownership and legacy. Throughout his whole life, Shigaraki is a force of destruction to be used and guided by others with base, selfish goals. But as we have seen, Shigaraki has grown. He isn't the helpless child anymore, but rather a thinking adult who has liberated himself from all notions and concepts that held him back. He is the true shadow of society and has begun eluding the grasp of those who wish to use him. Just look at how he finesses Overhaul and Redestro, both times refusing to be a pawn. It is also this quality that allows the selfish, generally insane League members to band together behind him, as they, on some level, understand that Shigaraki will lead to a broken horizon of boundless freedom. And it is that freedom, that liberation, that Shigaraki inevitably aspires towards. As the mirror towards society's failings, it is his natural inclination to destroy the society that gave birth to him. The important detail here is that this destruction is being done without concern for the future, a nihilistic tabula rasa under the mantra that whatever follows has to be better than what exists now. This is, again in stark contrast to our protagonist Deku, who specifically wishes to change the world into a brighter future. This again reinforces their parallelism and their opposite nature. They both wish to improve and save the world, but in completely different ways. To Deku, salvation is the existence of hope and continuous belief in the future, whereas Shigaraki believes that salvation comes in the form of indiscriminate destruction that sets all society back from where they can start over, a complete rejection of the future altogether, and rather, a new starting point. It is about whether to improve and reform the existing system or whether to tear it all down. It is about whether to go beyond the system's limitations and drag it up to a better level alongside you, or to rip it apart, annihilate its smallest segments and void it completely. It is, in the end, a conflict between going plus ultra and leaving everything into plus chaos. All of this is why I believe Shigaraki to be a phenomenal take on a shonen villain. His character arc tells the story of a child abandoned by society rising up step by step to destroy it, a story that evokes tropes of parallelisms and oppositions, which themselves create the thematic epos of a monster created by our own flaws. The question I posed at the start of the video is answered by Shigaraki's existence as we create monsters. Monsters are a product of the actions of humanity and our own tiny cruelties. Shigaraki presents a dark investigation of what a society failing truly means, and through that investigation lays bare the many ways in which not cruelty and malice, but indifference, ignorance and carelessness lead to the greatest suffering among us. He is the story of a child being twisted into a shadowy savior of the downtrodden, through both a deep lust for destruction and an evil that seeks to exist immemorial. And most importantly, he is an incredibly well-realized and layered character, whose story is filled with moments and aspects that flow towards both his narrative and thematic functions and reinforce him and by extension Hiroaka's greatest theme consistently and repeatedly. No one else represents the failings of Hiroaka's world better than Tomura Shigaraki, and therefore no one is more worthy of being this story's monster. And the best part? All of what I just discussed is only the beginning. As of writing this video, Hiroaka has reached what is its exact middle point pretty much, which means we are only halfway through this amazing story and are only halfway through Shigaraki's journey. 
He has now achieved both emotional and physical liberation and has transcended into a monstrous entity that the entire story now tries to deal with. And I cannot wait for what happens next. Thank you all so much for watching. If you enjoyed the video, be sure to subscribe and ring that little bell. If you want to support me on Patreon and have your name up like these cool people over here or over there, I don't know, you can do so in the link in the description. Take care, be safe, bye bye.